Good afternoon and welcome to today's talk by our friend, colleague, or instructor. And it's actually nice to see how many of you are sacrificing valuable uh, spring break hours uh, to join us here uh, this afternoon, Joshua Hill, on voting rights and rights, a century of elections without choices in mainland China. This talk is jointly hosted by the Department of History uh, as part of our faculty research seminar and uh, the Contemporary History Institute. So one thing I learned about Josh last week is, is simply that, that uh, he set a new gold standard uh, for introducing speakers in, in this uh, very room. And um, I, I thought about what I would do. Uh, and you know, if I were a less pedestrian military historian, I could perhaps turn to Sun Tzu um, and find some passage about patience and conquest or something like that that would, that would be uh, appropriate or Confucius and plagiarize the master himself. But I. I figure I would, one, keep this relatively short, and two, stick to what I know. And uh, that is that, um, well, I guess it's fair to say soon to be Associate Professor Hill, though I, I guess the more superstitious among us may have to knock on wood since that's still somewhere in the process uh, between Dean and Provost, I think. Um, is a terrific teacher of Chinese and Asian history across the ages uh, and eras. He's also someone who's taken on a major service role in the department as our director of undergraduate studies uh, with, with apparent gusto. And yet uh, his research profile has continued to, to soar as evidence, uh, evidenced most prominently by his uh, brand new book, Voting as a Right, A History of Elections in Modern China, published by Harvard University's Asia Center. And if we needed more evidence, uh, it arrived recently when Josh was uh, selected as a fellow in the National Asia Research Program at the National Defense University. Uh, in his work, uh, Josh Hill draws on the expertise of a historian educated just outside of Boston, um, but also on his experiences living in China. And on, on a personal note, in these past 18 months or so at CHI, I've really come to understand what a wide range of interests uh, Josh really has. And I, I greatly appreciate all your efforts on behalf of, of both CHI and the department. Uh, in fact, I hope that we can make North and Southeast Asian history as a, a, a growing focal point over the years. So with much appreciation for what you've done these past years and looking to many more working together, I, I hope that everyone will join me in a round of applause for Professor Hill. <laughs> Oh, I'm a little bit embarrassed. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you uh, to Charles Leiser for the invitation, as well as to Professor Shane and Professor Robin Reich, who do the uh, faculty, what is it, book of oh, Professor Shaddis as well, the, the uh, history department's um, uh, faculty research seminar as well. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, oh, do I need to stand by the microphone? I'm a little bit of a wanderer, I'm sorry. Uh, so I'm really excited to have the opportunity to come speak with you about my recently published book, which is a history of voting and elections in China. And the basic claim that I try and make in this book is that uh, if we want to understand why it is that there's been over a century of voting in China without ever there once being a mainland Chinese government that actually comes to power uh, because of what happens at the ballot box, then we need to take a look at what is the intellectual and cultural meaning of voting and elections uh, as they've occurred and as they've been understood by major political figures, major intellectual elites in mainland China. China. Uh, but the book doesn't stop with that. And in fact, when I think back to the book, and I have the picture up here, but I brought it as a thing so you could see it has actual physical presence. Uh, when I think back to the book, uh, which has taken approximately 25% of my life to research and to write, uh, I realize that I have a closer relationship with this topic than I do with any living human being, save for my parents, my two siblings, and my spouse. Uh, even my children, individually and collectively, are not as old as this book project. And <laughs> When I think about that, and when I sat down to think about what could I say about this book in approximately 30 to 45 minutes, uh, that wouldn't be excessively technical or wouldn't you know, involve delving into details that I'm really interested in in March of 2019, but wasn't interested in before and you may never be interested in. Um, I really began to be afraid that I would have nothing to say. Uh, I spent a lot of time trying to think about what would it be that would be useful for you to hear about this book. 
Uh, and so I'll let you in on what my solution to that was, which is I should tell you something useless about this book. And there's actually the philosophical grounding for talking about useless things. Uh, for those of you who have read any Taoist philosophy, uh, Zhuangzi, a fourth century Taoist philosopher, uh, speaks about the value of useless stuff quite eloquently. This is the philosopher who uh, probably his most famous passage is, uh, he has a dream where he's a butterfly and then he wakes up and he realizes he's not sure is he, uh, was he a man who had a dream of being a butterfly or is he a butterfly who's now having a dream of being a man? This is Zhuangzi. He enjoys that sort of paradox. And he has this to say in an argument he has with another philosopher about the value of useless things. And so he's in this uh, argument with another philosopher named Master Hui or Huizi. And Huizi's role in this text, I think, is just to be wrong. But he's the one who starts out talking. And so uh, this is from chapter one of the, the Zhuangzi text. Huizi says to Zhuangzi, I have a big tree, the kind people call spring. Its trunk is so gnarled it won't take a chalk line. Its branches are so twisted that they won't fit a compass or a square. It stands by the road, but no builder looks at it twice. Your talk is similarly big and useless, and everyone alike rejects it. But Huizi is wrong. So Drongza turns to him and says, Haven't you seen a weasel? It bends down, then rises up. It springs east and west, not worrying about heights or depths, and lands in a snare or dies in a net. Now the yak is so big, he looks like, he, he looks like clouds hanging from heaven. He sure can be big, but he can't catch mice. You have a big tree and are upset that you can't use it. Why not plant it by a nothing-at-all village in a wide, empty waste? You could do nothing, dilly-dallying by its side, or nap ho-hum beneath it. It won't fall to any axe's chop, and nothing will harm it. Since it isn't any use, what bad can happen? And so proceeding on that theory, I'm going to tell you things about the book that were useless enough that they did not actually make it into the book. And I will do that for most of the talk. And then at the end, for those of you who are curious about how this actually applies to the stuff in the book, I have a handful of sort of short case examples or case studies of how sort of these ideas or these feelings or these inclinations, these useless ones, uh, actually do say something relevant about the broader topic of the intellectual and cultural meaning of elections in China from the late Qing dynasty down to the present day. And it seemed to me that the most useless thing that I could tell you that was not included in the book uh, is the story of how I got interested in this topic. Uh, and it begins um, a little bit with how I learned the Chinese language. I didn't actually study Chinese in college. I went to China as an English teacher uh, and realized once I was there in 1999 that I would need to learn Chinese to communicate with my students. Um, and then also I, I became fascinated by learning it as well. And the way I learned is I traded English lessons for Chinese lessons with the, the Chinese teachers at my school at Huijin Academy in Ningbo. And uh, there's one teacher in particular who I spent a lot of time with, uh, Hu Ying, Hu Ying Alsher, who if she ever watches this online will be shocked, I think, that I am mentioning her or I remember her. But one of the things she would do with me is take me and walk me around the city and we'd go to places like the wet market and she would point out various things and tell me how to say them in Chinese. And I would, you know, ex her English was excellent. I'm sure I taught her nothing, but I gave her at least a chance to practice her English talking about these things in English. And after about a year of this, and after I became comfortable with how do you say carrots and lettuce and whatnot, and was interested in exploring political things, one day we walked around the wet market. And that Chinese wet market, uh, or farmer's market, is um, it's dozens, if not hundreds, of independent sellers, most of whom were growing their own food, who bring it into the city and are collected together in these stalls that are virtually indistinguishable from one another. So you have this whole row of people, and I tried to get a uh, picture that represented that a little bit, who have you know, come from the countryside into the city to sell their stuff. Uh, they're selling basically, I, from my perspective as someone who's not much of a cook, they're selling basically identical things. Uh, and so you sort of go up and down the line and you haggle over price. Uh, and so walking around with Hu Ying, I'll sure, uh, after I had begun to be interested in political terms, I turned to her one day and I said, I'll show you, teacher Hu, do you know what this is? And she said, what? And I said, this is capitalism, <laughs> right? Because it is independent sellers competing on price, and I guess if you know more about vegetables, competing on quality. Uh, and I was very proud of myself for making that sentence out. And she uh, turned to me with a shocked expression on her face. This was probably the year 2000. She turned to me and said, no, this is socialism. And I had always thought about that as being a really, um, maybe not a clarifying moment, but a really interesting moment because how is it that the two of us could look at the same site 
Whereas, you know, I'm looking at it, and it seems to me like a page out of Adam Smith of independent producers competing over price. You can haggle for things. Uh, you can, you know, feel their wares and decide whether you like their tomatoes or don't like their tomatoes. How is it I could look at that and say, this is textbook capitalism, and she could look at it and say, oh, no, it's, it's socialism, or it's the, the, social, the socialist market economy or something like that. Um, and for a long time, I think, I came out of the, this discussion thinking that, oh, I was the one who was right about this. I had the accurate uh, assessment of it. In retrospect, the more I've been thinking about it, I probably was not right. Underpinning what you could see here, there was, of course, a socialist economy still at work. None of these farmers owned the land that they were on. There was a complicated system that allocated uh, how they could get vegetables to the market and whatnot. So the hand of government was perhaps more visible than I thought. But this discussion got me extremely interested in the question of vocabulary, political vocabulary. How do you attach meaning to big concept words like socialism or capitalism? Uh, and as a, someone who at least aspires to be a good student, uh, even though I didn't really know all that much about China when I was living there, uh, I did bring my lecture notes with me from the one class on China I took as an undergraduate, which was a 300-person lecture on Chinese history I took solely to fulfill a distributional requirement. But I had brought those notes with me. And so, you know, fascinated by this issue, I went through them. And I did find, and these are actually my college lecture notes from 1998 and my syllabus from Professor Spence's class in 1998 as well, I did find that actually, you know, this was not a historically unprecedented thing. One of the things that uh, Professor Spence taught, and I remember this vividly from his class 20 years ago, uh, was that in the early 20th century, there's a revolution in how vocabulary works inside China. There need to be new terms for new ideas invented. And if I remember correctly, although I didn't quite take it down in my notes, uh, Professor Spence pulled out a list of words that were newly created in the Chinese language sort of in the period 1900 to 1920. And so I don't actually know what list he used, he used but uh, those lists are easy enough to find. Uh, this is a, from a dictionary compiled by a Chinese scholar named Li Yoning in the 1960s, in which she goes through and very carefully lists out new words in early 20th century China and what language they came from. Did they come from Japanese? Are they a, a reappropriation of ancient Chinese terms? Something like that. And the list is quite astounding. Uh, just to live, give you a handful taken at random. Petition. Abstract, as in like not concrete. Doctrine. Subjectivity. Leadership. Publication. Monopoly. Tradition, heavy industry, militarism, law and jurisprudence, court as in a legal court, reaction, reflection, plan or program, efficiency, consumer buying power, realism, reality, demobilization, system, rejection, feudal society, and you could go on and on with hundreds of these terms, newly invented, newly appropriated in the Chinese language to describe new concepts in the early 20th century. And so it seemed to me, you know, in my conversation with Huing, you know, was I seeing this process at work in the late 20th century as well? And when I went on to, to begin to work on a PhD, I pretty quickly decided that this is a concept I want to study. This is a concept I want to historicize. I want to find an example of it. Uh, and it's the quest to find an example that, oddly enough, leads me to elections. The first way I tried to look for this was to take a look at historical dictionaries. Uh, in particular, I looked at English-Chinese dictionaries published at different times in the late 19th and early 20th centuries. And those two are pretty revealing at the s of the speed with which the language changed. And new terms, important terms, but still terms that were perhaps poorly understood, come into the language quite quickly. And so I have a few excerpts from dictionaries to show you. Before I do that, just a brief note on how Chinese language dictionaries learn or work. This is a, not, a, not a historical dictionary, but a contemporary one. So you have, uh, for these um, character phrase dictionaries, you have the main character. In this case, this is the surname I use in Chinese, but it's also the verb to, to congratulate. And then you have a whole host of multi-character compounds with that, uh, typically with that as a lead character, although some dictionaries will also give it to you with the main character as a secondary character as well. We can use the size of entries, the number of multi-character uh, compounds underneath a single major character to get a sense of how the language changes and how new words are added. And let me give you one example that's, that's quite an interesting one. So to start with a dictionary, one of the earliest English-Chinese dictionaries, uh, but not the absolute earliest, but one of the earliest from 1882, using the character 
which is glossed up here, having to do with uh, skinning animals and all sorts of things, but also having some political uh, aspect to it or some sort of political explanation to it. We can see in the one that I've highlighted in blue here, a little bit, again, from this 1882 dictionary, some things that have sort of a political angle to them. So this longer compound, meaning to leave off old habits and to reform, or as another character compound, this character good and the compound guy good to mean to alter, to amend, to change. Jumping forward to a 1912 dictionary, we find that this character uh, has enjoying a surprising popularity and the number of words associated with it uh, has begun to be added. It's a term that's because of its linkages to issues of reform or change comes to be a popular term, a popular character to include in new compounds uh, to explain the changes with the end of the dynasty in 1911, the establishment of a new republic on January the 1st, 1912. And we see here at the end of the long list in this uh, 1912 dictionary, a phrase, gleming, glossed here in English by a, a, a very good translator, a British consular agent uh, stationed, in, um, well, stationed in Ningbo, among other places, city I would live in at the end of the 20th century. Uh, very good with Chinese. Uh, so clearly he's someone with his pulse on society and who's, who's listening around to the way words are used. And he glosses this final word that I have up there as name of a modern reform society. If we jump forward, and that's one to keep an eye on, if we jump forward to a 1931 dictionary, and this is the, uh, for those of you who've taken Chinese class, or if you ever take um, ancient Chinese class or, or classical Chinese, this is the Matthews Dictionary. This is the one that's still in print, and you're recommended to buy it if you're translating uh, older things. This term, or this character, G, now has a whole, uh, whole host of other words that come out of it including a whole list that begin with that last character compound, ge ming, which now is glossed as meaning revolution. And it is this character compound, and under this character compound, that Chairman Mao would rise to power in 1949. It's this compound that would enjoy an unusual amount of uh, political prestige and power throughout the post-1949 era, and even down to the present in certain ways. But it's a character compound that 50 years earlier had no meaning attached to it. And even 20 years before this, the meaning associated with it is vague and difficult to understand. So you have a process of new words coming into the language. They're circulating before they're fully understood. I thought that was absolutely fascinating. And so when it came time to try and figure out a dissertation topic, I said, this is what I want to write on. I want to find a way of trying to measure what words are used in society to get a sense of when does a term like revolution come to mean revolution? What's the process that uh, people can use to figure out this term? Like, if they don't know what it means, where could they go to look? That type of thing. The problem is what mechanism is available for doing that? I guess if I were doing this project and starting it now with all these uh, searchable databases, I might have different ideas. But the idea I had, and it turned out not to work, but the idea I had in uh, 2007 when I began to propose this project was there are a series of elections that take place in 20th century China. What was the language that was associated with people who were running for office? Couldn't I find, and this is a very naive idea, but this was my original idea, and this is how I ended up writing a book about the cultural significance of elections in China. I thought if I could find some of these elections, perhaps particularly these earliest elections where uh, the press is relatively free, where elections are competitive, and I find the campaign speeches that are used by candidates, or if I find examples of political slogans used by candidates competing, for, competing freely for elective office, then I could get a sense of you know, what terms were thought to have real meaning at this period in time, what terms were you know, too abstract to be used to gain the support of voters. Uh, and as I began to do more research, and you know, the fact that these elections occurred in China is a well-known fact for scholars of China, but there, there's very little direct writing about them. But as I began to do some initial reading in 2007, 2008, I became ever more excited about this topic, especially the first two elections that I have highlighted up there, the first of them taking place during the final days of the old empire, right before the dynasty is overthrown, the second, just after the Republic of China is found. I realized the scale of these elections was enormous. Just to give you one example, taken from this 1912-1913 series of provincial and national elections, over 300 political parties competed freely in these races, 
Obviously, that had its own problems because it was quite confusing. They're all new parties. People couldn't separate them. Uh, these parties would claim uh, candidates as members who weren't actually members. Uh, but nonetheless, the fact that there are 300 political parties competing freely is pretty interesting. On top of that, the, sale, the scale of these elections was immense. Again, just to look at the 1912-1913 election, national statistics indicate that approximately 40 million people inside China, or about 10% of the population at the time, were registered to vote in 1912. We don't actually know how many turned out to vote because that level is held at provincial levels and most provinces don't have that data available at all. But for the one province where I took most of my, my information from, uh, the province of Jiangsu on the coast, which is a wealthier province, a better educated province, so maybe their uh, um, turnout rate was higher than other places. But if we take them as a proxy nonetheless, approximately 60% of the voters in that province turned out to vote. And so if that can be used as a measurement for the entire nation, that yields us a number of maybe 24 million people turning out to vote in China in December of 1912 and January of 1913. To give you a sense of that scale, that 24 million voters in China at the time is 10 million more than turned out to vote in the American presidential election in 1912. So in other words, this event, not particularly well studied or well known, it was, one of, was the largest election in the early 20th century world. The problem with trying to look at this election and get information about candidates and how do they compete against each other and what political rhetoric did they use or what did they think was going to be uh, accessible to their audience is that none of that information actually exists. If you look in newspapers at the time, all you get are complaints about the election, you get complaints about the candidates running for office, but critically, there's almost never a name or a direct clear location attached to it, so you just get generalized complaints of, Alas, our election is a mess, oh no, oh no, but what can you do with that, right? Especially if you want to trace what terms would be useful. Uh, diaries of candidates for China's first parliament, which you think would be amazing sources, tell you absolutely nothing. I looked at several of them. I did not find a single person who told me anything about the process of running for office, although they normally did mark down if they were elected. <laughs> so, at this point in time, uh, although I did, I have to admit, think about giving this up, it occurred to me that actually I was making a category error. I was assuming in looking for elections as a mechanism for tracing political rhetoric that the meaning of elections was actually a clear and stable concept. So in other words, my idea was pretty much a Google Translate idea. Election and then the Chinese word, Xuanzhu for election, are exactly the same thing. But I realized, especially as I was reading these complaints about elections, that if I assume that this word is a new word in the Chinese language in the early 20th century, and it is a brand new word in the Chinese language at the time, and if I explore what did people think this word meant, so rather than looking at how did they use the process of voting to establish other forms of political rhetoric, but what did they think they were getting out of engaging in this process of voting, uh, then actually I could find a few very interesting things. Looking at uh, elections this way, and this is sort of towards the end of my useless part of this, looking at elections uh, as meaning something, as being a contested thing, a thing which is in the process of being defined, actually helped me begin to understand in a new light some of the existing things that we already knew about Chinese elections. And so now a few case studies of that and what we can get out of thinking about Chinese elections as being something that uh, are in the process in the early 20th century and the, even the mid 20th century uh, of being defined, being created, not as something that is a clear, uh, a clear transparent process that's just being implemented in China. To start with these case studies, I want to pull an example from a famous scholar of Chinese history, a man who, um, as a famous scholar in the 1950s and the 1960s, actually still an active scholar uh, at Academia, ac excuse me, Academia Sinica in Taipei, a man named Zhang Pengyuan, who has been extremely helpful with this project and invited me to give uh, a different talk about it at Academia Sinica several years ago. He is, I believe, in his 90s and still shows up for work every day in a suit. Uh, extremely and fearsomely productive uh, historian. He's one of the first, uh, and as of now, one of the very few historians to be deeply interested in early elections in China. Uh, and he also, the results of his research, again, mostly conducted in the, the 1960s, uh, the results of his research were, were basically very pessimistic. He took a look at these early elections, and I think he had in his own mind a very clear idea of what voting is supposed to be, what democracy is supposed to be. He looked at these early elections and said, 
they failed and they failed utterly because people in China just didn't didn't have the right mindset. To quote him directly, he said they had apathy. They had a lack of interest in elections. They didn't even understand what was going on. And he cites an example of this. This is an example uh, um, that's taken from an English translation of a, of a historical work he originally wrote in Chinese, published in the Journal of Asian Studies in 1978, uh, translated by a, an eminent American scholar, Andrew Nathan. Uh, and the example of how it is that people involved in this first election, this first uh, post-imperial election in 1912, didn't understand it, comes from um, an outlying area of China and Gansu province, uh, sort of off the beaten path, certainly far away from the educated and wealthy areas on the coast, where there is a provincial magistrate who is ordered to compile election rules. But this provincial magistrate, and you can see uh, Professor Nathan's English translation of this up here, but I have a, a, another one to show you in just a moment. Uh, this magistrate who's ordered to compile voter rolls of eligible voters in this, uh, you know, again, very rural, very out of the way place, uh, despairs. He says, I don't understand it. I can't figure out how to do it. And he writes back and he explains why. And the reason why he can't figure out what to do and here's where I'm going to move to my own sort of more schematic translation, is that he has misread the order he's received from Republican authorities in Beijing. They have sent him what they think is a quite clear order to, uh, and this is how it was supposed to be read, as a verb followed by a, a two-character verb followed by a three-character noun, with a two-character verb meaning to register, which admittedly is an un, um, uncommon usage of these two characters together, to register voters. But this magistrate, schooled under the Confucian uh, civil service examination system, a multi-tiered process of written tests used to pick officials in China from, um, well, for dating back uh, 500 years by this period in time, ending only in 1905, misreads the document that he is given. He understands it instead of being uh, a, a two-character verb and a three-character noun, he understands it as being two different verbs and then a two-character noun that means the second tier degree in the old imperial examination system. So in other words, he's reading this order to hold a democratic election as being what he feels is an improper order asking him to unilaterally appoint people to a defunct examination degree. And so he writes back to Beijing and says, I just don't have the right to do that. Right? They need to go take the written test which they can't because the system's been gone for seven years, but news travels slowly. And I mean, there's a lot of change in the system, so who knows? So uh, Professor Zhang in Taiwan looks at this and says that, uh, you know, this, this, is, this is completely problematic. He calls this hilarious. And then continuing with the story, he says, uh, to quote the historian who brought this to all of our attentions, he says, we can infer from the level of the magistrate's confusion Sorry, we can infer how hilarious this is from the level of the magistrate's confusion. And thus, the indifference of ordinary people towards the election cannot be seen as unusual. But here's the thing. If we understand that this is a new term with an unclear meaning attached to it, it's maybe not so unusual or unexpected that this man might, understand, might misunderstand. And if we go a step further, the word that's being used for election is itself the same title that was used for the defunct written civil service examination systems. If you go back and look at the dynastic histories compiled by every dynasty about its predecessor, after it overthrows its predecessor, they each include a chapter, which if you translate it in modern Chinese, would be translated as the chapter on elections, but you shouldn't translate it that way. You would translate it as the chapter on selection and appointment for office. It's no wonder that someone educated under the old system would be completely and utterly confused by this. Again, election is not a sort of fe uh, clear, firm, uh, hard system that everyone would understand, but is a newly introduced term where people are trying to figure out exactly what it's going to do and what it's going to mean. If we add on top of that the way in which this system in the language used for it even in its various structures, seems to overlap in a lot of ways with the old defunct civil service examination system. It's not surprising at all that there would be a level of mental slippage, that people like this uh, magistrate, and this is the article in the original newspaper which mocks him and tells us that he is uh, stupid and confused, 
It's not, it's not surprising at all that this magistrate would be confused by the overlap in the language. It's not at all confusing, or it's not at all surprising, or should not be surprising, that he would mistake it for a continuation or a revival of the old civil service exams. This insight actually began to help me as I turned back to looking at rhetoric generated by the early elections in 1909, 1912, and then 1918 and into the 1920s as well. If you read this rhetoric, if you read these complaints about elections as reflecting the fact that most of the people participating in them had somewhere in the back of their minds that these elections are not supposed to be competitive races between people who are articulating different ideas and who are going to be picked on the basis of their popularity. But instead, if you think about these elections as being talent selection mechanisms, just like the old examinations, they're going to, that are going to pick people who are objectively and universally considered to be talented and moral, then you can realize why it is that newspapers only and repeatedly would print criticisms of the election process and would phrase these in the vaguest possible terms. A few examples as we move into a sort of a second case study about that, of trying to take a look at complaints about elections based on this confusion or this mental slippage and overlap between the idea of voting and elections and the old civil service examination system. Again, to draw from major newspapers in China, these are major Shanghai-based newspapers uh, in the, the period of the, the beginning of the Republic of China, 1912, 1913. If we read them and take a look at the uh, copious exhortations to voters that they published in this time, we can get a sense of the values from the uh, examination system that are being recapitulated for use in elections. To give you one example, an editorial printed by the Shenbao newspaper in Shanghai in September 1912, which again doesn't actually mention any candidate or party by name, it contains this uh, proclamation to voters that says, in part, if our country cannot make use of the truly talented, then it will be very difficult to strengthen ourselves. The truly talented are those who simultaneously possess the four qualities of scholarly ability, experience, trustworthiness, and fortitude. If our country has people who are truly talented, then voters must not fail to select them merely because of some personal opinion that a voter might cling to. This is made... This is a highbrow publication made for an educated audience, but uh, the voting public, which is fairly constrained, 10% of the population, all property owning men, uh, you know, sort of spilled out over the edges of the highly educated people who would read a Shanghai newspaper. Uh, and instead, if we take a look at publicity material generated by the government in 1912 meant to explain to ordinary people what was going on with elections in sort of ordinary speech. We can find the same set of ideas uh, explained in a much more direct way. To cite from one lecturing manual prepared by the provincial government in inland Hunan province, uh, meant for government lecturers to travel around from village to village and talk to people about the election law, it includes a passage in which voters are told this, they are supposed to cast their votes for, quote, a person you know to be reliable and not to allow them to be, not, uh, voters are not supposed to allow themselves to be distracted by, uh, quote, unquote, feelings that would cause them to vote without any thought at all for a friend or a relative. When it turns out, once elections are held, and most people in China voted for their friends or their relatives or people they had other pre-existing ties with, or voted on the basis of party affiliation or all the other things that drive people in democratic parties to go vote in a particular way, the elites who organized these elections, who talked about them, who discoursed on them in newspapers, were appalled. Now they come to the one that I have up here, which I didn't give you the English translation of because I will just read it to you. An editorial, again, from this highbrow Shanghai newspaper published right after the first round of voting is over when it's become clear that many people of talent and skill have not been elected to office uh, and instead uh, people who are merely popular have. This editorialist complains, uh, although I am not myself a voter, uh, and why that is, I have no idea because it's anonymous. But although I am not myself a voter, I can basically understand the psychology of the average voter. The best voters have their own beliefs, are not dominated by political parties, and are not swayed by campaigning. Fundamentally, they think their own thoughts. The next best kind of voters are those who adopt the ideas of a political party as their own ideas. Beneath them are the kind of voters who are immersed in a village mentality and who take on a localist mindset. Worse than these are those who are greedy for friends and place personal relationships at the center of their worldview. The worst are the voters who have no thought at all and are only in it for the money. 
Based on the current situation, as in the elections that have just finished, voters with no thought of their own make up 60 to 70 percent of all voters, and not even one out of every hundred voters follows their own thoughts. If you think that elections are going to pick the talented and the moral, then this is clearly a failure, even though if we could you know, send UN inspectors back in time or Carter Center monitors back in time, actually it's not clear to me at all that they would say that these elections in China in 1912 and 1913 were unfair, were poorly run, certainly there were problems, there are fights at the polling booth sometimes, but it's an election that works without government interference, it actually seats a parliament that's fairly elected. Uh, the parliament ends up being disbanded, there's a military coup, it doesn't establish a government, but nonetheless, it's an election that itself works. If we think about the elections as having some sort of resonance with the old examination system, then actually a second purpose for our elections, beyond simply selecting for the talented and the moral, uh, comes to the fore as well. And that's the idea that the process of having people come out to vote is itself an educational opportunity. And it's an educational opportunity for the voters who are going to be taught by the people who design the elections what it is to be a citizen of a modern state. The process of voting involves government interference in a lot, or government intervention or, or um, contact with the government in a lot of different ways. It involves registration, where you give your name to the government. It involves being brought into contact with the symbols of the government. And in a situation like early 20th century China, where the government changes a lot, you might not have seen the flag of your country before. You might not necessarily know its new formal name. Being registered to vote is a, is a part of that. If we look at discourse on elections from China, and I'm going to use some examples both from the late Qing but also from uh, the communist era, and we look at the way elections are talked about with this in mind, with the notion that it's sort of like the exams, it has an educational component, we can see that intellectuals and political leaders discuss this openly. Unfortunately, there are no pictures from the early period in time that show voter registration. There's actually no pictures from 1912 or 13 that show voting as well. So I have a, a 1908 Woodbrock illustration of public lecturing in the countryside. But this is basically the type of thing uh, that was envisioned by these types of reformers uh, who saw the idea that the very process of getting people together to register or to actually go cast ballots was a useful time to indoctrinate them in the ideology of the new state. And again, they were quite open about this. One manual written for uh, voter registrars in, in um, uh, uh, excuse me, in Jiangsu province told voter registrars that they should use the voter, the voting registration uh, as an opportunity to uh, take, or to, as an opportunity that they can take advantage of and explain to people the policies of the government in general so that the people uh, who are being registered to vote will avoid misunderstandings. A uh, similar um, document from another province, from Jiangxi province, again, a document meant to explain to people how to run an election, tells us uh, a similar thing, but in even more detail. This document uh, from 1909 exhorts registrars to understand that, the, that, now to quote directly, the social customs of Jiangxi province have only just begun to be enlightened. Few here understand the rights of citizenship. Families of great wealth and prosperous countryside households are particularly likely to make a principle of closing their doors, focusing inwards, and avoiding external concerns. The voter registration process is intended to use clear language in order to dispel their great confusion. The idea is to bring people in and have them take part in the state. If we think about elections in China as meaning this, then actually the distinction that I tried to draw earlier between these two uh, elections that took place at the end of the last dynasty and the beginning of the republic where there was free and unfettered competition and all of these later elections in which uh, candidates were typically pre-appointed or winners were pre-approved even before voting began, the difference between them is actually not so great. Why is it that subsequent governments, even as they began to restrict and ultimately by the communist era end any form of competition uh, for office, uh, why is it that they continued to hold uh, elections? It's because they saw the educational potential of them to be so great. This is something that's celebrated quite openly in documents, if we jump forward to the communist era after 1949, which designs, uh, amazingly enough, its own election system, devotes a substantial amount of effort in a period in time in which China is just emerging from civil war, is after 1950 fighting a war with the United States and Korea, yet nonetheless this government spends an enormous amount of time, first in 1953 uh, and, then, and then into later in the 1950s as well, designing voter registration laws, dividing designing voter registration processes, and propagandizing the process of getting people to go out to vote. 
The idea, again, being not that their selection of particular candidates for office is going to mean anything. And the authorities in 1953 and 1954 are extremely obvious in their writings, and they're explicit in the way they explain this to people, that you are only going to have a choice of one candidate for each office. So it's going to be voting by acclamation. And they devoted an enormous amount of time to talk about it. We actually have the uh, inner party reports, or the um, sort of the the um, uh, the sort of inside circulation reports from the party uh, the party cadres who organized the election in 1953 and 1954, where they despaired about how much they had to explain to people it's still an election even though there's only one choice of a candidate. And why is it they devoted so much time to doing this? It is again this notion that if you bring people together. You show them the symbols of the state. You give them a piece of paper, as we see with this woman who is getting a voter registration card right here. You give them a piece of paper that has information about the state on it. It has the name of the state. It has your name right next to it, that you will see yourself as part of a new, uh, of this sort of broader process. The state for its worth, uh, the People's Republic of China for its, for, uh, uh, for its own part in this period in time celebrated this aspect of things. They highlighted voters who cherished their voter identification cards. Uh, to give an example of one person, and again, we don't really have real names for any of these people. This is just people who are highlighted in sort of newspapers or propaganda writing at the time. Uh, one woman from a rural county in Jiangsu province who is referred to in the writing as, as Granny Han. Uh, uh, was quoted as talking about how happy she was that she could wrap her voter ident identification card in a bright red cloth and store it at the bottom of a chest near her bed along with her property deed, something given to her by the communist authorities as well, as a symbol of her new inclusion in the state. Now, of course, if you're going to include people in such a public way, there's also an issue of exclusion as well. And that certainly was part of the way that the People's Republic of China used its own election laws. Registered voters had their names displayed publicly for everyone to see, which meant that for those who were not allowed to register because of political reasons, they were noticeably excluded. So these are workers checking out their names on the voter registration list. In theory, this was supposed to have had an enormous impact on the mindset of individual voters. In practice, again, it's hard to measure. We can't uh, find reliable uh, polling data from the 1950s of to what extent did being registered as a voter change your conception of yourself and your relationship to the state. But again, if we take a look at approved propaganda from the time, we can find that this was a common trope. To pick the most famous example, the last emperor of the Qing dynasty, Pui, five years old when he's overthrown in 1911, so he's a non-factor in the, the end of his dynasty or the revolution, survives into the communist era. He spends uh, sort of a, a lonely youth living in the imperial palace until he's kicked out by warlords in the 1920s. He uh, goes along with Japanese militarists when they invade Manchuria in 1931. He is made the emperor of a, of a puppet Japanese state uh, in northeastern China for the duration of World War II. After the war, he is uh, captured first by uh, the Chinese nationalists, then by the, or first, excuse me, first by the Soviets, then by the uh, Chinese Communist Party. He's put on trial. He's put in jail, but because he is so famous, he is going to be made a symbol of the rehabilitative powers of the new state. He spends the 1950s in jail. If you've seen the movie The Last Emperor, this is his official story as, uh, as uh, given to us from his official approved biography or autobiography that he write, writes upon his release. Uh, his time in jail, he realizes sort of the error of his old ways, the ways in which the old society and feudal thinking had kept him down, had forced him into these terrible roles. He's going to rehabilitate himself. And what is the symbol of his rehabilitation if you read his approved autobiography? An autobiography that was so important for the regime when it's published in 1964 that the final edits are done by the prime minister, Zhou Enlai himself. The final symbol is when Pui receives his voter identification card in 1960. The voter identification card is actually pictured in the book, and Pui talks about it at length. He says this, on November the 26th, 1960, I received a voter's card with my name on it, and it seemed to me the most valuable thing I had ever had in my life. Uh, again, an amazing thing from an emperor. And when I put the ballot into the red box, I felt I was the happiest man on earth. I, along with my 650 million compatriots, was now the owner of our 9.6 million square kilometers of land. This is so important to him, he actually returns to it again several hundred pages later at the end of his autobiography, where he says again, this is how my new life began. 
when I think of my home, my voter registration card, and the boundless prospects that stretch out before me, I will never forget how I gained this new life. The idea of participating in elections as a way of re-educating, uh, giving people a new subjectivity, allowing them to come into uh, participation in a new state. Even the process of voting without candidates competing for office can be conceived of in this light. I realize this photograph is not a great one. It's from a Shanghai newspaper in 1954. It's of how you conducted these elections in a period in time in which most people are illiterate, where you have universal acclamation by raising your hand. Again, you can think about the physicality of this act, bringing people together and asking them all to do the same thing at the same time to approve of the new state, because not only do you have the person being elected in the background, behind them, of course, you have the portrait of Chairman Mao and slogans which I cannot read because of the fuzziness of this, but which uh, we can all assume what they mean in terms of um, celebration of the new state. If we think about this other purpose of elections as being an educational one, we can even see this theme, this trend, this idea coming through long after the period of Chairman Mao. And we can even see it come up in pretty unexpected ways. As a way of sort of bringing this down to the present day before I conclude, we can even see this type of rhetoric of elections being useful because they are helpful as educational tools. And the person who devised the village election laws that have often been held out as a hope for a, a China that can democratize from the ground up. The person who organized these laws and who pushed them through the systems, pushed them through the system, despite an enormous amount of resistance, Peng Zhan, is himself a veteran communist cadre, one of the founders of the People's Republic of China, one of the people who designed the, the People's Congress election laws uh, that Pui and, and the other voters I was just talking about participated in. In the 1980s, after Mao's death, during the period of sort of reform and opening up, Peng Zhan and other reformers, but sincerely dedicated communists like him, proposed that the state allow for a level of, a, of free elections at the village level for village committees. And again, this was taken as a sign, and has been taken as a sign, at least in the West, as a, as a, you know, that maybe there's a spark that's going on at the village level in China that will filter up the system. As villages can elect their own government, so too perhaps one day will townships, maybe counties, maybe prefectures, maybe provinces, and then one day we'll have an elected government in Beijing. Peng Zhang would have been horrified at the concept, and instead he talked about what he saw the value of grassroots level elections, these village elections in China, as being, as being purely educational. In the final debates, at least what we have in the published versions, of the final debates over the uh, implementation of election laws from the late 1980s, village election laws in the late 1980s, Peng claimed grassroots self-government organizations, and these are the village committees that are elections, are going to function as what he called, quote, a training class in democracy. But his idea of class is a very literal one, not one that you're going to graduate from and therefore get to use democracy on your own, but as literally a place where you can be trained and taught to come to understand the system, to come to identify with the system, and come and be a part of the system. This brings us to the argument of the book, which I've tried to sketch, uh, sort of the useful stuff that came uh, uh, after the useless stuff at the very beginning, how I became interested in writing a book that argues essentially that elections in China for most of the last century have been understood as ways of selecting for the talented and the moral, and when that turned out not to be a, a, a productive path, have been understood as a tool for educating an otherwise unwilling uh, and un unknowledgeable, ignorant populace. It's worth noting, just by way of a, a, final, a final thought or a final conclusion, that all of these types of elections continue in mainland China today. Elections for the People, Co People's Congress, elections at the village level. When I was doing final revisions on this book and I was living in Changsha in the end of 2016, it was the time for the local People's Congress election. This is a random alleyway that I happened to be walking by right after they were plastering it with uh, propaganda images for why you should participate in the election. The slogan itself says, uh, exercise your democratic rights according to law, cast your sacred ballot, or cast a sacred ballot. But in the present day, it seems like this has very little uh, useful power or very little explanatory power, very little motivational power for most ordinary people. It seems to me that both those who run these elections, who seem fairly desultory about it, and those who participate in them, and we do have polling data from participants, many of whom report afterwards that they have forgotten immediately who they voted for, um, <laughs> 
we have very little evidence that these elections as they're conducted today have resulted or will result in any sort of ide uh, ideological change, whether they still have any sort of educational function at all, which begs the question, is there any purpose in continuing? Are these elections perhaps not just another useless thing that could be added on top of this? Uh, I ended my book uh, in a hopeful note by trying to say that while that it does seem to me to be the case that in present day China, these elections generate little excitement, they neither select for talent nor educate voters to any particular degree, the fact that they still remain and still happen maybe, um, maybe means at some point in time that another meaning could be attached to them. After all, these meanings of talent selection, of education, that I argue have been attached to elections for a century, um, they're the products not of some sort of uh, unalterable natural force that arises from Chinese culture or the depths of the Chinese past. It's because intellectuals in the late 19th and early 20th centuries thought these ideas seemed reasonable and tried to persuade others, largely successfully in the middle of the 20th century, that they were. Now that these ideas don't seem to have much power, maybe someone's going to come along and attach new ideas to elections. And so maybe one day these things that in 2019 seem like strange relics of the past might come again to have a new and perhaps very different meaning in mainland China. And with that, I will conclude and take questions. So thank you very much for staying, uh, staying for this. And I will clap too. I think I have a blank slide there. Yes, please. Uh, is the electorate in China much better informed now about how elections are all over the world? The good and the bad of all the worldwide elections, I guess. So there is substantial attention paid in the, the Chinese media to elections overseas. And that includes not just elections in the US and Europe, but also elections in Taiwan, where very little of what I've just said applies. Uh, the highlighting, the way the, the state-run media has highlighted elections overseas, particularly in recent years, uh, not just looking at the United States, but also looking at South Korea, uh, also looking at Japan, uh, also looking at uh, the UK with Brexit, is that elections are divisive. They allow people who know very little about things to exercise sort of their, um, their random whims in public and that those then have to be translated into public policy. And wouldn't it just be better to have a state where you have really smart leaders who make decisions on their own, and those decisions don't have to be ratified. Uh, that argument has, it seems to me, been persuasive on some level to people inside China, but there is also a pushback to that. Josh, um, so I kind of look at the little brother of China, which is Vietnam, and a lot of the things that you say about China really apply to Vietnam um, about elections, alas. One of the things that I realized that some, sometimes reading through memoirs of high-ranking party um, members is that it, it seems like at the top level of the party, at the central committee le level, um, and the, the whole way that people were chosen to become central committee members mm. and how, who, got to, who then went into the central executive committee and stuff, seemed very murky and I didn't understand it, but my sense from reading some of the memoirs was that maybe there really are actual elections there that, that um, I just was wondering if you saw any sign um, of that at the top, at the upper level of the party, um, do they have voting that, that it, it seems like it's, it's really the candidates aren't that there is a choice, um, and it's not just a kind of empty ritual, that it is about actually selecting, um, there, there's some uh, uncertainty about it. So the short answer to your question would be, I would use your word murky to describe the process in China as well. So how do people end up in the Central Committee of the Chinese Communist Party? How do you end up from there into the Politburo or the Standing Committee of the Politburo? Uh, outsiders have very little idea. There is a rhetoric of, I've been elected to this position, uh, but realistically, what, the, what does that mean? Nobody knows. Uh, the approved memoirs that come out from high-ranking party officials uh, 
are interesting and enlightening when they refer to broad ideological issues. Uh, but when you get down to real specifics, like why does a particular person come into power at a particular time? I don't necessarily trust them. I mean, they're all pre-vetted before they're published. So we, you know, we don't know what's being cut out. The archives of the Chinese Communist Party are obviously closed to researchers. So, uh, or at least the Central Party archives are. So, you know, you're never going to be able to double check anything you read in some of these official, um, official accounts of events. More broadly, looking at intellectual discussion in China, there was, although I'm not really sure it's ongoing anymore, there was for a while in the early 2000s a discussion of so-called uh, intra-party democracy. That there should be voting inside the party for particular offices, but I don't think it actually really went anywhere. Uh, and again, at the end of the day, the, the rhetoric of being voted voted for by party leaders, or the rhetoric that party leaders have of themselves of being elected to office is... Um, you know, one you again you have to take with a grain of salt. Uh, a final anecdote that occurs to me uh, is, um, and I'm forgetting the year this happened. I think it was probably about 2005, sometime in the first decade of the 21st century. The then president of China, Hu Jintao, uh, took a state trip to Japan, and uh, part of that trip involved him visiting an elementary school of Japanese students who had been studying the Chinese language and so they could ask him questions freely right because little kids what could go wrong and one of these uh, Japanese pupils who spoke some Chinese stood up and said uh, something along the lines of President Hu uh, how is it you got to be the leader of such a great country <laughs> and so um, Perhaps caught off guard and retreating back to some of this rhetoric, Hu Jintao's widely mocked response was, oh, I was elected by the people of the country, uh, but not in any sort of direct sense, of course. <laughs> sure, Professor Shane. So that, that builds a little bit on the question I had in mind, which is if, 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 if it's an RITE, the actual mm -hmm. Mm. choice, if you will, is, is who's going to be the person who is going to be, you know, by acclamation, put into office? What's the process by which that, uh, that happens? So it changes over time. Uh, and it's a complicated process. So it's not just the Communist Party, but also the Nationalist Party before them uh, in their more dictatorial phase that had the idea that if they could just pick candidates beforehand and know who's going to win, then they can eliminate the bad side of competition and they can get the people they want into office and that those people will be publicly acknowledged as being talented and moral, so it will all work out. Uh, but it took a long time to figure out what type of system would work for that because you only have so many people whose loyalty and whose character you can be assured of, and you have lots in a place the size of China, you have lots and lots and lots of elective offices. I tried to figure out for present day China how many people are in the local people's congresses. Uh, I'm blanking off the top of my head of whether I was able to succeed. I mean, my sort of off the, uh, like off the you know, back of a napkin estimate is probably somewhere around 100,000 members of various local, uh, local people's congresses all across China. So how do you vet that number of people? How do you make sure the candidates who are getting in are going to be the ones you want? Um, and it's tough. The Chinese Nationalist Party did a very poor job at it. They tried to do it through favor trading, uh, and it turned out that people would go back on their word afterwards, that people would uh, agree to, to take office and support the Nationalists, but then not do it. The Chinese Communist Party, which is significantly more uh, effective and significantly more efficient at making choices and enforcing them than the Nationalists were, uh, tried to do basically a nationwide survey of people. They sent work teams down to the precinct level to organize each of these elections. And part of what the work teams would do is they would interview community members and ask them, who do you, who do you like? Who do you respect? They would go interview that person and see, do we think this person is politically reliable? And then we say, oh, we, we want to nominate you for office. That worked some of the time, and if you read propaganda accounts of the elections in communist China in the 1950s, uh, those are the accounts that are talked about. You know, the party sent a, um, a work team down to a factory. All the workers said, oh, we admire the most efficient worker on the factory floor. He makes more, he makes more walks than the rest of us, in one example that's coming to mind. And so the party says, we would like you to be our candidate. And then people vote for him, and they already like the person anyway, so it's fine. This ran into lots of problems in other, in other parts of China where the politics were more complicated. Some parts, and this is not drawing on my own research, but drawing on the research of a Chinese scholar named uh, Zhang Jishun, who um, teaches at uh, East China Normal University. Uh, she looked at how voting worked in the 1950s in some parts of Beijing, where uh, just because of geography, 
Chinese converts to Catholicism were in the majority. And so party work teams went into those areas and said, who do you admire? And they picked people with church affiliations. And the party said, well, this can't be right. We can't have those people running for office because they all have uh, you know, uh, relations with the, with the Catholic Church, which still at that point in time uh, in China still had its relationships with Rome much more clear than they are in the present day. So this is an idea that you know, didn't work out everywhere. It didn't work out as clearly uh, as is um, manifested in official propaganda. Yeah. Sure, it's a Chinese social scientist who collected it. It's a, a, a report called, um, what is the proper title? It's, it, it actually was translated by, by a state-run publisher into English as well. It's called something like um, The Chinese Political Person or The Chinese Political Man, I think might be the direct English translation of it. It's a Chinese sociologist who did a, a study about political values of Chinese people and using you know random sampling of thousands of people. Uh, how it is that the findings about the National People's Congress and the percentage of uh, people who didn't remember who they voted for, how is it that that got to be published? I don't know. Uh, the only two explanations I can offer is, one, there was a period that decisively ended about five years ago, but there was a period earlier in the 21st century in China where there was a relative amount of sort of political and cultural liberalization. So there was a greater space for... Um, uh, non-approved thought, especially if that's a non-approved thought that's articulated in a dense format by an academic, so no one else is going to read it anyway. Uh, and the second thought I have about how this polling was able to be done is uh, if you read the chapter summary at the beginning of this, and I think this is another useless thing I didn't put in the book, but it was something that, that fascinated me as I read it. If you read the chapter summary that, that he puts at the beginning, the abstract that he probably expects is what most people would read and not read the chapter, it says, our election system is extremely successful. Look at all of the people who participate in it. Isn't it great? And then you read down to the data about how, what do people actually think about it, and you see a level of indifference. Just a second. Yes, Heather. Um, so with China and some of the non-Western countries being much more closed off to Western scholars, did you find resistance when you were trying to or because you had built relationships over there that they were much more welcoming to you investigating and conducting the research for your book? I had enormous problems with archives, but none of those problems were political in nature. Uh, so the main archive I intended to use closed quite suddenly for a, a mammoth digitization project that lasted several years. Uh, after I had gotten my grant to be there, after I had gotten an affiliation at a university in the city, and after I had moved there, but not just moved there, but also moved with my wife, who I just married the month beforehand, so it made her move to a completely different city in China. Um, but that had nothing to do with my topic. It just, that was when they decided to, in an unannounced manner, do a digitization project. Um, but otherwise, I was really surprised by the access I got. The access I got, which I think you probably could not get in the present day um, in a significantly tighter environment in China, but the access I got in 2008, 2009 uh, to documents from before the year 1957, I thought was amazing. Uh, some of the things that I didn't cite in here, but did make it into the book, um, include internal party reports about places where the election went completely awry. And some of the things they quote are astounding. In um, the province where I take most of my examples from, there was a spate of suicides of people who uh, had wanted to be registered voters and then thought that their rejection to be registered voters was a symbol of their rejection by the new state, so they killed themselves or attempted to kill themselves. Uh, this is not, doesn't appear in any external newspapers meant for anyone else to look at, but party officials talked about this quite openly. They talked as well about um, places in this province, in Jiangsu province, where local level authorities who are um, running the voter registration campaign in 1953, 1954, 
in a, against a backdrop of a civil war that had only ended five years earlier, a nationwide basically counterinsurgency or sort of anti, sort of like mopping up operation against remaining nationalist forces. Uh, notice the suppress the counter revolutionaries campaign that was only two or three years over by the time elections are held. Uh, Several other very violent campaigns, including the land reform campaign that results in the death of one to two million landlords during this period in time. So against the backdrop of that, many of the local level cadres looked at instructions about how to register voters, how to classify people into politically reliable voters and the number of adults who are not going to be allowed to, to vote and saw this as yet another invitation to violence. And so uh, one of the interior, or one of the internal reports I read uh, was a, uh, provincial level party official complaining about a village cadre who had asked him directly in this campaign, in this mass campaign to register voters, how many people should we kill? Uh, so I was shocked by the number of things I could look at. Uh, clearly the materials I was looking at were not, were not well vetted, or if they were, it's probably astounding what was in the stuff I was not allowed to see. Uh, would I be able to look at that stuff in the present day? I don't, I don't know. Uh, I traded English lessons with the children of the archivists at that archive uh, for access, and so that helped me out. And then, um, I don't know, I didn't cause a problem for them, and that, that I think worked out too. Ooh. Sure. Do you expect that to be a bestseller in China or to be uh, um, taken off the shelves? Neither. Uh, <laughs> I don't expect it to be a bestseller here. Uh, it will be for sale in China, you believe? No, probably not. Um, yeah, probably not. <laughs> Although the vast majority of it, you know, it deals with the pre-communist era, so it has little to do with the party in power today, and so is not, uh, not particularly politically sensitive by any means. Sure, a final question, and then we can let everyone go. Exciting one, but, um, can you <laughs> tell us a little bit about the, the definitions of democracy in China? Um, does that include elections? Um, do they, is that part of the? So the, is a, I, I'm trying to think of what's the short answer to this question rather than what's the long answer to this question. Uh, I mean, the official position that, that would be in is given in China is that China is a democratic system. Uh, and it's a democratic system in the sense that it vests sovereignty in the people, that government is conducted on behalf of the people. If you think about traditional political philosophy in China, this would be in distinction to sovereignty is vested in heaven, that government uh, occurs in order to sort of harmonize human forces with supernatural forces, that sort of thing. So in that sense, this is a people-centered state rather than a, um, you know, a supernatural-centered state or a state centered towards Confucian ideals of human harmony, that type of thing. Um, Mao had his own particular definitions of democracy that uh, decidedly did not include uh, a vision of elections. He thought any sort of institutions that came between people and their exercise of power were illegitimate. Mao is actually sort of the interesting outlier in this entire book of all major 20th century political leaders in China. He's the only person who seemed to me to have basically no interest in elections for most of his life. Uh, and the best bit of, of evidence for this is that the period in time in which he enjoys unfettered rule over China this is basically the period of the Cultural Revolution, 1966 to 1976, even going back a few years uh, before that. That's the, that's the longest period of time in 20th century China in which there are no elections of any kind. Uh, he just, he thought of this stuff as being uh, yeah, a way for tricksters to, to introduce themselves between the people and um, uh, their exercise of power. All right, thank you so much for coming. Enjoy your breaks. Uh, and